Hello students. Today we're going to read The Night Face Up by Julio Cortazar. Remember to grab the story using the link below the video. Uh, let's get into it. You'll notice the first thing is a bit of a disclaimer here where Julio Cortazar says that at certain periods they went out to hunt enemies. They called it the War of the Blossom. And the asterisk corresponds to the note at the bottom here. And that note tells us, the War of the Blossoms was the name the Aztecs gave to a ritual war in which they took prisoners for sacrifice. It is metaphysics to say that the gods see men as flowers, to be so uprooted, trampled, cut down. So right off the bat, he's giving you this war type imagery. He's talking about men getting cut down, being offered as sacrifices. So that should give you uh, at least something to, to go on when we start reading this story. So I want you to think about the stuff that's a little bit strange in this story, where you're kind of going like, ah, that's weird, why would he do that? That's, that seems a little bit odd. Because remember, this is, um, this is magic realism, and this uh, genre has a bunch of those kinds of twists and turns. <clears throat> so let's get into it. The Night Face Up by Julio Cortazar. Halfway down the long hotel vestibule, he thought that probably he was going to be late and hurried on into the street to get out his motorcycle from the corner where the next door superintendent let him keep it. On the jewelry store at the corner, he read that it was ten to nine. He had time to spare. The sun filtered through the tall downtown buildings, and he, because for himself, for just going along thinking, he did not have a name. He swung onto the machine, savoring the idea of the ride. The motor whirred between his legs, and the cool wind whipped his pants legs. He let the ministry zip past, the pink, the white, and a series of stores on the main street, their windows flashing. Now he was beginning the most pleasant part of the run, the real ride. A long street bordered with trees, very little traffic, with spacious villas whose gardens rambled all the way down to the sidewalks, which were barely indicated by low hedges. A bit inattentive, perhaps, but tooling along on the right side of the street, he allowed himself to be carried away by the freshness, by the weightless contradiction of, his hard, of this hardly begun day. This involuntary relaxation possibly kept him from preventing the accident. When he saw that the woman standing on the corner had rushed into the crosswalk while he had still had the green light, it was already somewhat too late for a simple solution. He braked hard with foot and hand, wrenching himself to the left. He heard the woman scream, and at the collision, his vision went. It was like falling asleep all at once. He came to abruptly. Four or five young men were getting him out from under the cycle. He felt the taste of salt and blood. One knee hurt, and when they hoisted him up, he yelped. He couldn't bear the pressure on his right arm. Voices, which did not seem to belong to the faces hanging above him, encouraged him cheerfully with jokes and assurances. His single solace was to hear someone else confirm that the lights indeed had been in his favor. He asked about the woman trying to keep down the nausea which was edging up into his throat. While they carried him face up to a nearby pharmacy, he learned that the cause of the accident had gotten only a few scrapes on the legs. Nah, you barely got her at all, but when you hit, the impact made the machine jump and flop on its side. Opinions, recollections of other smash-ups, take it easy, work him in the shoulders. First, there, that's fine. And someone in a dust coat giving him a swallow of something in the shadowy interior of the small local pharmacy. Within five minutes, the police ambulance arrived and they lifted him onto a cushioned stretcher. It was a relief for him to be able to lie out flat, completely lucid, but realizing that he was suffering the effects of a terrible shock, he gave his information to the officer riding in the ambulance with him. The arm almost didn't hurt. Blood dripped down from a cut over the eyebrow all over his face. He licked his lips once or twice to drink it. He felt pretty good. It had been an accident. Tough luck. Stay quiet a few weeks. Nothing worse. The guard said that the motorcycle didn't seem badly racked up. Why should it, he replied. It all landed on top of me. <laughs> they both laughed, and when they got to the hospital, the guard shook his hand and wished him luck. Now the nausea was coming back little by little. Meanwhile, they were pushing him on a wheeled stretcher toward a pavilion further back, rolling along under trees full of birds. He shut his eyes and wished he were asleep or chloroformed.
But they kept him for a good while in a room with, the hosp with, that, with that hospital smell, filling out a form, getting his clothes off, and dressing him in a stiff, grayish smock. They moved his arm carefully. It didn't hurt him. The nurses were constantly making wisecracks, and if, he hadn't been, if it hadn't been for the stomach contractions, he would have felt fine, almost happy. They got him over to X-ray, and twenty minutes later, with the still damp negative lying on his chest like a black tombstone, they pushed him into surgery. Someone tall and thin and white came over and began looking at the X-rays. A woman's hands were, arranged, uh, were arranging his head. He felt that they were moving him from one stretcher to another. The man in white came over to him again, smiling. Something gleamed in his right hand. He patted his cheek and made a sign to someone stationed behind. It was unusual as a dream, because it was full of smells, and he never dreamt smells. First a marshy smell. There to the left of the trail the swamps began already, the quaking bogs from which no one ever returned. But the reek lifted, and instead there came a dark, fresh, composite fragrance, like the night under which he moved in flight from the Aztecs. And it was all so natural. He had to run from the Aztecs, who had set out on their manhunt, and his sole chance was to find a place to hide in the deepest part of the forest, taking care not to lose the narrow trail, which only they, the Motecas, knew. What tormented him the most was the odor, as though notwithstanding the absolute acceptance of the dream, there was something which resisted that would that which was not habitual, which until that point had not participated in the game. It smells of war, he thought, his hand going instinctively to the stone knife which was tucked at an angle into his girdle of woven wool. An unexpected sound made him crouch suddenly, stock still and shaking. To be afraid was nothing strange. There was plenty of fear in his dreams. He waited, covered by the branches of a shrub and the starless night. Far off, probably on the other side of the big lake, they'd be lighting their bivouac fires. That part of the sky had a reddish glare. Now, bivouac fires are like the campsite for like a military, so if you think of these Aztecs as being like a hunting party, kind of like a military hunting party, and they're setting up their fires as they're hunting these motecas, that's what he's talking about when he says these bivouac fires. So it's just um, the situation where Aztecs are kind of hunting down these motecas. <clears throat> The sound was not repeated. It had been like a broken limb, maybe an animal that, like himself, was escaping from the smell of war. He stood erect, slowly, sniffing the air. Not a sound could be heard, but the fear was still following, as was the smell, that cloying incense of the war of the blossom. He had to press forward to stay out of the bogs and to get to the heart of the forest, groping uncertainly through the dark, stooping every other moment to touch the packed earth of the trail. He took a few steps. He would have liked to have broken into a run, but the gurgling fens lapped on either side of him. On the path in the darkness he took his bearings. Then he caught a horrible blast of that foul smell he was most afraid of, and leaped forward desperately. You're going to fall off the bed, said the patient next to him. Stop bouncing around, old buddy. He opened his eyes, and it was afternoon. The sun already low in the oversized windows of the long ward. While trying to smile at his neighbor, he detached himself, almost physically, from the final scene of the nightmare. His arm, in a plaster cast, hung suspended from an apparatus with weights and pulleys. He felt thirsty, as though he'd been running for miles, but they didn't want to give him much water, barely enough to moisten his lips and make a mouthful. The fever was winning slowly, and he would have been able to sleep again, but he was enjoying the pleasure of keeping awake, eyes half-closed, listening to the other patient's conversation. Answering a couple of que excuse me, answering a question from time to time. He saw a little white pushcart come up beside the bed. A blonde nurse rubbed the front of his thigh with alcohol and stuck him with a fat needle connected to a tube, which ran up to a bottle filled with a milky opalescent liquid. Sounds fun, huh? The young intern arrived with some metal and leather apparatus, which he adjusted to fit it onto the good arm to check something or other. Night fell, and the fever went along dragging him down softly to a state in which things seemed embossed as though as through opera glasses. They were real and soft, and at the same time vaguely distasteful, like sitting in a boring movie and thinking that, well, still, it'd be worse out in the street and staying. A cup of marvelous golden broth came, smelling of leeks, celery, and parsley. A small hunk of bread more precious than a whole banquet found itself crumbling little by little. His arms hardly hurt him at all. Excuse me, his arm hardly hurt him at all. 
and only in the eyebrow where they'd taken stitches, a quick hot pain sizzled occasionally. When the big windows across the way turned to smudges of dark blue, he thought it would not be difficult for him to sleep, still on his back, so a little uncomfortable, running his tongue out over his hot, too dry lips, he tasted the broth still, and with a sigh of bliss, he let himself drift off. First, there was a confusion, as of one drawing all his sensations, for that moment blunted or muddled into himself. He realized that he was running in pitch darkness, although above the sky crisscrossed with tree top, treetops was less black than the rest. The trail, he thought. I've gotten off the trail. His feet sank into a bed of leaves and mud, and then he couldn't take a step that the branches of shrubs did not whiplash against his ribs and legs. Out of breath, knowing despite the darkness and silence that he was surrounded, he crouched down to listen. Maybe the trail was very near. With the first daylight, he would be able to see it again. Nothing now could help him find it. The hand that had unconsciously gripped the haft of the dagger climbed like a fen scorpion up to his neck where the protecting amulet hung. Barely moving his lips, he mumbled the supplication of the corn which brings about the beneficent moons and the prayer to her, high, to her very highness, to the distributor of all Motekin possessions. At the same time, he felt his ankles sinking deeper into the mud, and the waiting in the darkness of the obscure grove of live oak grew intolerable to him. The War of the Blossom had started at the beginning of the moon and had been going on for three days and three nights now. If he managed to hide in the depths of the forest, getting off the trail further up past the marsh country, perhaps the warriors wouldn't follow his track. He thought of the many prisoners they'd already taken, but the number didn't count. Only the consecrated period. The hunt would continue until the priests gave the sign to return. Everything had its number and its limit, and it was within the sacred period, and he on the other side from the hunters. He heard the cries and leaped up, knife in hand, as if the sky were a flame on the horizon. He saw torches moving among the branches very near him. The smell of war was unbearable, and when the very first enemy jumped him, leaped at his throat, he felt an almost pleasure in sinking the stone blade flat into the haft, flat to the haft into his chest. The lights were already around him, the happy cries. He managed to cut the air once or twice, then a rope snared him from behind. It's the fever. The man in the next bed said, The same thing happened to me when they operated on my duodenum. Take some water. You'll see. You'll sleep all right. Laid next to the night from which he had come back, the tepid shadow of the ward seemed delicious to him. A violet lamp kept watch high on the far wall like a guardian eye. You could hear coughing, deep breathing once in a while, a conversation in whispers. Everything was pleasant and secure, without the chase. No, but he didn't want to go on thinking about the nightmare. There were lots of things to amuse himself with. He began to look at the cast on his arm and the pulleys that held it so comfortably in the air. They'd left a bottle of mineral water on the night table beside him. He put the neck of the bottle to his mouth and drank it like a precious liqueur. He could now make out the different shapes in the ward, the thirty beds, the closets with glass doors. He guessed that his fever was down. His face felt cool. The cut over his eyebrow barely hurt at all, like a recollection. He saw himself leaving the hotel again, wheeling out the cycle. Who'd have thought it would happen like this? He tried to fix the moment of the accident exactly, and it got him very angry to notice that there was a void there, an emptiness he could not manage to fill. Between the impact and the moment they picked him up off the pavement, the passing out or what went on, there was nothing he could see. And at the same time, he had the feeling that this void, this nothingness, had lasted an eternity. No, not even time. More as if in this void he had passed across something, or had run back immense distances. The shock, the brutal dashing against the pavement. Anyway, he had felt an immense relief in coming out of the black pit while the people were lifting him off the ground. With pain in the broken arm, blood from the split eyebrow, contusion on the knee, with all that a relief in returning to daylight, to the day, and to feel sustained and attended. That was weird. Some day he'd ask the doctor at the office about that. Now sleep began to take over again, to pull him slowly down. The pillow was so soft and the coolness of the mineral water in his fevered throat, the violet light of the lamp, 
up there was beginning to get dimmer and dimmer. As he was sleeping on his back, the position in which he came to did not surprise him. But on the other hand, the damp smell, the smell of oozing rock, blocked his throat and forced him to understand. Open the eyes and look in all directions. Hopeless. He was surrounded by an absolute darkness. Tried to get up and felt ropes pinning his wrists and ankles. He was staked to the ground on the floor of dank, icy stone slabs. The cold bit into his naked back, his legs. Dully, he tried to touch the amulet with his chin and found they'd stripped him of it. Now he was lost. No prayer could save him from the final... From far off, as though filtering through the rock of the dungeon, he heard the great kettle drums of the feast. They had carried him to the temple. He was in the underground cells of Teokali itself, awaiting his turn. He heard a yell, a hoarse yell that rocked off the walls, another yell ending in a moan. It was he who was screaming in the darkness. He was screaming because he was alive. His whole body with that cry fended off what was coming, the inevitable end. He thought of his friends filling up the other dungeons and of those already walking up the stairs at the sacrifice. He uttered another choked cry. He could barely open his mouth. His jaws were twisted back as if with a rope and a stick and once in a while they would open slowly with an endless exertion as if they were made of rubber. The creaking of the wooden latches jolted him like a whip. Rent writhing, he fought to rid himself of the cords sinking into his flesh. His right arm, the strongest, strained until the pain became unbearable and he had to give up. He watched the double door open and the smell of the torches reached him before the light did. Barely girdled by the ceremonial loincloths, the priest's acolytes moved in his direction, looking at him with contempt. Lights reflected off the sweaty torsos, off the black hair dressed with feathers. The cords went slack, and in their place the grappling of hot hands, hard as bronze. He felt himself lifted, still face up, and jerked along by the four acolytes who carried him down the passageway. The torchbearers went ahead, indistinctly lighting up the corridor with its dripping walls and a ceiling so low that the acolytes had to duck their heads. Now they were taking him out. Taking him out, it was the end. Face up under a mile of living rock, which for a succession of moments was lit up by the glimmer of torchlight. When the stars came out up there instead of the roof and the great terrace steps rose before him, the fire with the cries and dances, it would be the end. The passage was never going to end, but now it was beginning to end. He would see suddenly the open sky full of stars, but not yet. They trundled him along endlessly in the reddish shadow, hauling him roughly along, and he did not want that. But how to stop it if they had torn off the amulet, his real heart, the life center? In a single jump he came out into the hospital night, to the high, gentle, bare ceiling, to the soft shadow wrapping him round. He thought he must have cried out, but his neighbors were peacefully snoring. The water in the bottle on the night table was somewhat bubbly, a translucent shape against the dark azure shadow of the windows. He panted, looking for some relief for his lungs, oblivion for those images still glued to his eyelids. Each time he shut his eyes, he saw them take shape instantly, and he sat up, completely wrung out but savoring at the same time the surety that now he was awake, that the night nurse would answer if he rang, and soon it would be daybreak, with the good, deep sleep he usually had at that hour. No images, no nothing. It was difficult to keep his eyes open. The drowsiness was more powerful than he. He made one last effort. He sketched a gesture toward the bottle of water with his good hand, and did not manage to reach it. His fingers closed again on a black emptiness, and the passageway went on endlessly, rock after rock, with momentary ruddy flares. And face up, he choked out a dull moan because the roof was about to end. It rose, was opening like a mouth of shadow, and the acolytes straightened up. And from on a high, waning moon fell, and from on high, a waning moon fell on a face whose eyes wanted not to see it were closing and opening desperately, trying to pass to the other side to find again the bare, protecting ceiling of the ward. And every time they opened, it was night and the moon. While they climbed the great terrace steps, his head hanging down backward now, and up at the top were the bonfires, red columns of perfumed smoke. 
and suddenly he saw the red stone, shiny with the blood dripping off it, and the spinning arcs cut by the feet of the victim, who they pulled off to throw him rolling down the north steps. With a last hope, he shut his lids tightly, moaning to wake up. For a second, he thought he had gotten there, because once more he was immobile in the bed, except that his head was hanging down off it, swinging. He smelled death, and when he opened his eyes, he saw the blood-soaked figure of the executioner priest coming toward him with the stone hand in his excuse me, with a stone knife in his hand. He managed to close his eyelids again, although he knew now he was not going to wake up, that he was awake, that the marvelous dream had been the other, absurd as all dreams are, a dream in which he was going through the strange avenues of an astonishing city with green and red lights that burned without fire or smoke on an enormous metal insect that whirred away beneath, between his legs, in the infinite lie of the dream, they had also picked him up off the ground. Someone had approached him, also with a knife in his hand, approached him, who was lying face up, face up with his eyes closed between the bonfires on the steps. I love the story because of that twist. Um, and if you look carefully, you can see it coming in the text. Um, you can see him building that up. But it is a really interesting twist to me. Alright, uh, check out the, uh, the activity, the assignment for this that goes along with this reading, and then um, also check out the answer video if you need some help with that. Alright, see you in the next video.